NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from Lamu County. Now in this episode, we're about to meet an incredible group of fishermen who have taken up the job of being reef rangers thanks to the Nature Conservancy and the Northern Rangelands Trust. Now this means that they are taking up a key role in protecting the environment both in the ocean and on land. Now for me to meet them, I've actually got to get on a boat, ride for about an hour and a half because they're based on Pate Island. So come with me. Welcome. Asante sana. All right. Cool. Good? Okay. Wow, what a wonderful, warm welcome to Faza village here in Pate Island. We have been welcomed by a parade and with me is George Miner. He is the Marine Project Coordinator of the Nature Conservancy here in Kenya. What are we witnessing, George? This is a group of rangers from Pate Marine Community Conservancy and Kiunga community conservancies. This is actually a, an expert group of rangers who have been specially trained to monitor the reef and fisheries. It's a part of a bigger group of rangers. Wow, they are doing an excellent job over here on the land, but no doubt a lot of their work takes place in yeah. the water as well. Mm. Why is there a need to have what we're calling reef rangers? Well, Smitty, I will tell you that uh, we are facing big problems in terms of fisheries. You know, overfishing, damaging fishing practices, and uh, the situation is made worse by the impacts of climate change. And uh, one very important component that needs to be done in order to tackle this problem is to have a group of uh, community enforcement officers. And this is exactly who these rangers are. Why then would you have rangers um, on land as well? What are the, some of the challenges there? You know, in Kenya we have government protected areas, both in the marine and also on land. And you know, most of these wildlife, some of them very endangered, 70% of them are found in areas that are not protected. And so we need the community enforcement officers like these reef rangers to protect the wildlife that are found within the community. The wildlife and fish that they go every day to exploit. So we need all this wildlife to be secure and we need the habitats that they are depending on to be kept in a, to maintain the balance and the community members play a key role. Well, it, it certainly is a very big role because they are taking charge essentially of everything around them in terms of the environment mm -hmm. on land and in the water, George. So what effort has TNC, that's the Nature Conservancy, and NRT, the Northern Rangelands Trust, put into this to train them? Because um, protecting wildlife can be quite scientific. We are partnering with our collaborators here mm -hmm. and even abroad and particularly Northern Rangelands Trust, us as the Nature Conservancy, because we value partnerships. We achieve more by partnering with others. And so what we've done, we are investing in training these rangers, equipping them with skills on how to 
uh, to patrol, to enforce, and to monitor their resources. And, about, and again, we are also making sure that they have uh, uh, sufficient management capacity, and we, we are also strengthening the community-led institutions that have been formed by government with support from partners like mm. fisheries beach management units, the community conservancies. So we are putting a lot of efforts, effort in making these community institutions function well. And it works hand in hand with the government as well? Exactly. We, we work very closely with government mm. because with, without government we, it will be hard to succeed. Of course. And also, you know, for, for the sake of creating synergy, Yes. And also, you know, maximizing on the, on the few resources that we have. Okay, George, we are going to find out so much more about how this works and really watch the rangers go in and do their job. But before that, I'm going to speak to the leader of the community to find out how this community has been transformed and how the environment is being protected. With me now is Atwas Swabir. He is the chairman of the Pate Marine Community Conservancy. Thank you so much for welcoming us to uh, Faza Village here in Pate. Uh, Mr. Swabir, really, how have the lives of the community been changed and improved thanks to the work that the reef rangers do? The security now, because our rangers take time to patrol all these areas mm -hmm. to see that people work in peace, there is peace and there is security. And um, for their personal lives, some of these rangers uh, have never been trained before. How have their lives improved? Uh, rangers, we have really trained them, but on wildlife in Manyani Training Center, where the KWS are trained there. Mm -hmm. And they have also gone to Malindi uh, Marine Park for just to see the marine environment. And how has um, the lives of the community in general here in Faza changed? The life has changed because people have understood that these uh, resources are theirs and they should uh, conserve them so that they, they, they use them day and night in a better sustainable way. Uh, before, People just could fish and how they want mm -hmm. with destructive gears. People could cut mangroves and how they want, but now we have the control. People have to, to go by the rules, which the community laid themselves. Mm -hmm. It's the community laid. We have some uh, managed areas, and these managed areas, we are doing the co-management together with the government, mm -hmm. the fisheries department, the KWS, the KFS. They are all involved in making this management plan. Therefore, we come together, we sit in one table, and we say these are the rules. Thank you very much, sir, for having us here uh, in Faza village on Pate Island. Now we head out with those reef rangers. So we're about an hour out of Faza village on Pate Island and now on the south of Pate Island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. George, it's great to be here. Such, such a beautiful sight with the water surrounding us. And now the fishermen and the reef rangers are ready to head out into the water. Tell us what we should expect. You know, the challenge we face is that um, we often lack uh, data that can be used to develop management decisions. So these rangers, the reef rangers, what they are going to do in the next uh, uh, three or so hours, 
they are going to be counting fish wow. under the water. That doesn't sound like an easy task because many people think there are plenty of fish in the sea. They have been living in the sea, they have been swimming, they know the fish. They, I think it's a simple job for them. <laughs> All right, well, we'll check it out. How do they document this data because they're underwater snorkeling? Well, they've been trained. They also have their own uh, local traditional knowledge. So they combine the science that we are providing together with their local uh, ecological knowledge. And what we do is that uh, they use these slates. Okay, these underwater? Slates, yeah, which they go with underwater. Oh, wow. And they have a pencil and the slate is uh, prepared mm -hmm. like a data sheet. Mm -hmm. So they swim down there and they can be able to write. All right, so it sounds like they've got a lot of work to do. Um, they are a busy lot and I suppose we better let them get on with it right now. So ranger number one will be counting fish. So what they want to know, they want to know the number of fish or the abundance of fish that is under there. So they are not counting all fish, but they have selected some key indicator fish. Mm -hmm. That is fish that is important as a food source, fish that is important for maintaining the health of, health of the habitat, and fish that is also endangered. He will start swimming along a tape measure that will be lined on the benthic, mm -hmm. on, the, on the ocean floor, 50 meters. Then ranger number two will follow ranger number one to make sure that he doesn't get lost and also ensuring that uh, he doesn't exceed 50 meters. And then when they get to 50 meter mark, they will swim back. They will be looking at macro invertebrates. So these are basically uh, animals that don't have backbones and they stay on the ocean floor. So these are the key fish that they'll be monitoring. And so they have listed the fish mm -hmm. on the slate. So at the end of the transect, they will have counted fish in a 50 meter by five meter area. There are some of these invertebrates, which are so many down there and they can't count everything. So for like sea urchins, they will just do the counts in the first 10 meters only. The third ranger and the fourth ranger will come in. They will like to know uh, how much dead coral we have down there, mm -hmm. the live coral, the seagrass, and uh, even rocks and sun. So it's been about two and a half hours that the reef rangers have been in the water doing their job and collecting critical data. I'm about to speak to the sergeant to find out what his role is because he wasn't in the water, but he has the data so we'll find out what exactly was seen and why it's so important and I'll speak to some of the reef rangers to hear more about their experiences. <laughs> nikijaza hizo form walipoa wakaenda kwa diving wakirudi mimi ndo na shirika na hiyo form sasa mimi sikuenda kulingana na vile kuna GPS lazima ni mark ni take time wajua wameanza saa ngapi na wamaliza saa ngapi na wakirudi ndo natukua form naanza kujaza kwa 
mali pake. Walipoenda waliporudi na majibu walimekuwa ni majibu mazuri sababu wameona samaki kile tunaotaka wameona wameona inverter bread pia yuko hapo mambo ya koros pia wameziona hasa ndo wakirudi hizo form tunaangalia tujue ni kitu gani ambacho kimeathirika na vipi samaki wame, wame increase ama wamepungua mambo ya inverter bread pia tuone kwenye hao maeneo ambao wameangalia kama wako ama hakuna na mambo ya koros leaf kuchujue kwamba ziko hai ama zimekufa ndio hizo zina tusaidia sisi kwa jamii yetu tunajua ni samaki wamezidi katika hii jamii katika hii maeneo ama wamepungua na nimependa sana kuhifadhi wanyama wa bahari ni kazi mzuri sana na pia naipenda kwa maji yake ni fresh hana madhara ya ugonjwa ni fresh water mimi wake unajua vile uko hai na vile kufa unapata ku, na samaki walioingia na waliotoka na tunapata idadi ya samaki ni wangapi na maji wa loko hai na waliokufa sababu leo utajua kama hapa ni mawe yako hai in case kesho nitakuja kama imekufa nitapata kuona nitapata kumaka imefanya kwa miaka 34 katika wizara ya fisheries na kazi yangu ni hususan ni kulinda mazingira na kuiangalia rasilimali ya community itumike vyema na tumeshirikiana na shirika la conservancy e, kwa sababu moja ya kwanza ni kwamba kuwafundisha namna kuhifadhi kwa sababu sisi tumeendelea kabla wao kwa hivyo tuko na ujuzi wa kutosha sisi kwa vile miaka mingi kuishafanya hii kazi ya fisheries na tunazuia mitego pia ile ambayo haistahiki kutumika ndio eh, kazi ambayo tunashirika nayo zaidi. Kumuhimu wa kuhifadhi kama sisi wakati wa sasa tuliambiwa kulikuwa na kasa kuna nguva tulijionea. Na pindi sisi tunapo watoto wetu nao pia tutaki waambiwe kama story takawajionee pia wao. Ndio maana tukaamua kujitolea ku conserve our nature. So it's been a long day out with the reef rangers in Lamu. We are now, though, getting closer back to Faza village in Pate Island, uh, off uh, Lamu Town Island. And George, I've got to say, you know, the work of the reef rangers isn't as easy as one may think it could be. What are some of the risks involved in the work that they do? The rangers, as you saw, they were fighting against the current. Yeah. You know, like ranger who was counting fish, there was another one following him behind, just to direct him to count fish in a straight line of 50 meters and 5 meters right. wide. So, so the, the risk of, you know, being washed mm -hmm. by the current. There, there are also some uh, dangerous and poisonous uh, organisms down there. You know, the sharks are there. There are other poisonous uh, fish like stonefish and others. And uh, we've got to be careful when we are working underwater. George, what happens next? Now the data has been collected. What is done with it? The rangers will put these data into uh, data sheets and we will uh, show them how to analyze that and then thereafter we are in the process of developing a database mm -hmm. that the rangers will be putting in the data directly into a computer and the computer will generate reports for them. By reports I mean simple graphs that the rangers can print and present in their community meetings and discuss the trends. All right, so it seems very critical to involve the community. Why is it so important, do you think? Well, I, I think it's all about making them own their resource and making them be able to see how their resource is changing over time. If they don't assess and monitor their resource and see how the change is coming, have the figures to describe that, then they, will be, they won't be able to uh, uh, discuss in their meeting and trigger some uh, management uh, decisions. And how often will these reef rangers go out? Because it's happened today, when is the next time? Some of these fish have a very, uh, they have different life history traits. Some of them will show an increase after maybe several years, like 10 years or okay. 5 years. So for this monitoring to be effective, uh, the rangers will be monitoring after 6 months. The reason be behind this is because so that they can capture what it 
what is the situation during yeah. let's say rough season okay. and during calm season because really if they were to do it any more frequently it wouldn't have such an impact because very little change would happen exactly. within that time you, you don't expect to go to the to some of the sites we went and uh, see a, any significant okay. difference within so, a short period of right. time of like a month or so george thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, for that and remember that uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Northern Rangelands Trust uh, doesn't only work with reef rangers underwater, but there are also rangers here on land that are supported by these two organizations. And after the break, we'll find out much more about those rangers. This is NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from Lamu County. Let's, though, for now, take a quick break. Much more when we return. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Now we are at a place called Rewa here on Pate Island. And George, now a lot of the work that the rangers do actually does take place in the water, but not all of it. A lot of it is mm. on land. Tell us more about what they do over ground. On land, what they normally do, they monitor what they see like carcasses of wildlife. And by wildlife, because this is a marine-based con community conservancy, they look uh, at uh, carcasses of sea turtles. So from sea turtles, they also monitor any other wildlife animals that are uh, within the island. And also, do they do other work regarding mangroves, for example, or any other sort of criminal activity? Because they are rangers, so they are responsible for a lot on land. Yeah, uh, th this, this place is very important in terms of mangroves. Uh, 67 of uh, mangrove cover of the Kenyan coast are found in Lamu, and Pate Island is a place with a, a, a lot of these mangroves. So what the community does, they do enforcement. They patrol within the mangroves, to, to see whether there is any illegal logging that is happening and actually that's what they try to stop in collaboration with uh, other stakeholders. Now where we are standing at the moment is a very significant site. Mm -hmm. Tell us why. Well this spot is what the local community call as a slaughterhouse for turtles. Really? Yes. Why is that? Explain. And this is because the area you see behind us mm -hmm is where fishermen come in, those who want to evade any arrest and they have ill intentions, like they have caught turtles. So they come here to unofficial fish landing sites yeah. where they land their catch, including poached turtles, and they slaughter them here. Mm. But why is this area very popular with turtles? What's different about it? This is a very good feeding area for turtles and they come here to feed and the fishers know where uh, these turtles frequent and so they go there to set nets intentionally or unintentionally and they end up catching turtles. All right. Okay. Mm. Well, it is the rangers that are responsible for catching these people who actually poach and kill the turtles. As you remember in one of our earlier episodes from Watamu, turtles are really uh, critical to the environment, to the ecosystem, and they are endangered. So really, they do need to be protected. Let's head over now and uh, find some of the rangers and see what they're up to. Oh, wow. This is huge. Yes, it is. This is Charlie and Sergeant Warden. All right, Habari. So, Charlie, uh, Warden, yes, uh, Jambo. Zulisana. Tini Nini, my gosh. This is a carcass, turtle carcass. Mm. And this is basically the shell, which means all the, the body of the turtle has been removed. So, what species of turtle is this? Uyu ni kasa wa kawaida ambayo imetuleta sisi kuja hapa na patushulike kazi ni hawa ni wa uinjaji haramu poting ndio wanaifanya kazi wanachukua hizi wanakuja hapa wanachinja wana they doing the solatan wanachinja oh. halafu wanaenda kuuza na wanakula ama nini yeah, yeah ndio wanakula Wow, I mean, this is huge and it's such a heartbreaking sight because remember in our earlier episode on NTV Wild Talk, we saw a greenback turtle, a live one that was 
this size. And now to think that these are just empty shells and the turtles are dead. So um, what is your job as the ranger? What do you do? Eh, na kama sis rangers sote wa tuko tight na kupambana na hawa wanyajaji haramu ili wasiendelee kuwa uwa hawa kasa kiholela holela you find the carcasses here lakini unapata hiyo pocha ndio hawa potters wa sana wanatumia akili hmm. pangine stamu ile sisi ambao tumetoka kwa da patrol wao pangine wanatoka mapema sana yeah. wanafanya kitendo kitukije wa imalizika lakini tupia tume kuwahi kupambana nao pia mashua kwa bahari wakiendelea na mchego lakini huwa tunaokoa hawakasa ni kulingana sharia uwezi kumshukua mtu ikiwa kasa ameshikwa na net mm. wani kumokoe kumokoa kasa mmokoe ili maisha yake yawe safe aende zake so kazi yako iko gumu kazi ni ngumu lakini na sisi tunapambana hivyo hivyo ni mm. kazi na tupata majukumu wajua tuna majukumu ya maisha majukumu ya ina watoto watoto tunasomesha yeah. tunawalea sasa sasa na tuko ngangari na sisi na kazi okay na na hii notes iko ya nini hii ni data sheet uh -huh. ambazo tunajaza wildlife carcass kuna fui kuna hii form ya wildlife carcass ambazo tunajaza wao tunaandika mambo jipe si namba mambo ya tarehe na ile size ya huyu mnyama uh -huh. alafu na na aina ya huyu kasa ikiwa na kike au na kiume wa pesa tunajaza katika hii kartasi. Mhm. Mm Alafu na umri wake pia tunajaza iko na adult au sub adult wa tunajaza. Okay. Mm. Now how often do you find carcasses um, in a week? Carcasses mingi ama kidogo? Wakati wa nyuma ilikuwa bado conservancy bado pata marine community kwa service bado haijaundwa walikuwa kasa ni wengi sana wapangine kwa wiki moja wana wazo kuwa pangine kasa 50 au 60. Mm. Lakini jamii ilikaa ya BMU walikaa chini ili wakaileta fikra wa kuhifadhi mazingira wakaona umuhimu wa umuhimu wa kuhifadhi hawa kasa ndio sasa ikaundwa ikikosi inaitwa party community party marine community kwa service rangers ndio ikaundwa askari wote kwanza mtanga wanda kizingitini ndao paka mtanga wanda okay. sisi baada ya kuja kufanya kazi yeah. tulihamasisha watu kwa wingi board mm -hmm. na sisi rangers tumefanya awareness kwa kuhamasisha watu okay. na watu wamekuja kujua kumbe fiki kumeleta fikra wameelewa sasa ni kitu gani umuhimu wa kasa ah, okay. nafikiri the number of potting sasa yeah. imepungua okay, okay. sio kama ilikuwa ya kawaida yeah. thanks to the work okay. that you and your team are doing okay. sawa okay and when you find these okay. sasa utafanya nini na hii eh once tumekuja hapa tumeona ikakas kwa kwanza lazima tutukue jipes tu report mm -hmm. tuandike tupige radio kwa ofisi tupeane report halafu hizi kaka shells tukipata sisi huwa tunafuku mshimo tunafanya barrel okay. tuende sasa tuende kidogo okay jump oh oh heavy oh, oh. Oh my. Okay. Oh. Wow, this must have been a massive turtle just carrying this shell is heavy. You can only imagine what it would be if the turtle was in here. Okay, so let's do this burial. So George as this um, burial is taking place you know it is very heartbreaking but at the same time uh, there is a positive side to it because action is being taken to address the issue how confident are you that really this is now the way forward the incidences of poaching have gone down yeah and which means that the wildlife are being secured. Yeah, they certainly are and as you speak, uh, one of the rangers is bringing in another shell as well, uh, which goes to show oh and that has a head. A head on it as well. All right, sour too. It's it's a really heartbreaking sight. But how confident are you that really uh, things are changing? Well, oh, uh, several months ago I visited this site and what we saw was uh, heartbreaking. You know, we saw 
more than 10 carcasses of turtles and so we come back here and we, we, we see three. It's not a good thing to happen but uh, we are hoping that this trend of declining poaching mm. will, will, will continue and eventually the community will be able to put this thing to an end. Okay, all right. Well, as we help uh, bury the rest of this in just a moment, we'll be heading back to Faza village and we'll speak to the pioneer, the woman behind this entire training project. So now we're back in Faza village here on Pate Island and with me is Juliet King. She is the technical advisor for the Northern Rangelands Trust. Welcome to NTV Wild Talk, Juliet. Thank you. Now, Juliet, what we've witnessed is pretty incredible work by the reef rangers and the rangers on land as well. You are actually the sort of pioneer behind all of this, especially here in this area. Tell us how it all started. Um, well, I've been working with Northern Rangelands Trust for 10 years now and we originally came up with this uh, idea around uh, setting up monitoring systems that the rangers can do for themselves um, and which uh, empowers them to, to look at the information, to make decisions around the information they're collecting, to improve the management of their conservancies. So historically, monitoring is usually done by scientists and often it's an external thing. Results are presented to people and they're supposed to act on it. And the, really the, the feeling was is that we needed to devolve this to the conservancies, get them to do that themselves. And that would uh, essentially uh, give them a stronger mandate and a, and a stronger tool to, to manage their own resources and to understand what was happening with their own resources. And um, based on sort of your interaction with them, are they beginning to understand the importance of their resources and the importance of conserving it? Very much so. I think, you know, this is something that for people who are dependent on, the, on natural resources, so whether it's pastoralists who are dependent on grass and, and gr dependent on the land for their, their livestock, or whether it's fishermen who are dependent on, on fish stocks, they know that things are changing and they understand that their, their wildlife are declining, they're losing grass, they're losing fish, and, and their livelihoods that depend on that are suffering. So they understand this is happening and what we're trying to do is, is give them a systematic way of measuring that so that they can, this is something that they can really carefully look at over time and then see what management actions they can do to then to change that. How intensive has this sort of training been for them? Because uh, these are fishermen, men of the village who perhaps have never really interacted with such sort of science. How complex is it? Well, you know, we, we've taken science and we've tried to simplify it down to something that communities can not only do themselves, because I think what I've found is that um, most of the, the rangers I work with are, are very uh, enthusiastic, really want to learn, and you can, they can be trained and they can be very good at doing it. And the, the, the trick is about then the, the next stage, which is analysis and interpretation of that information. So yeah, it's, it's, a long, it's something we do gradually over a couple of years, and you introduce little elements at, at a time. All right, so step by step. <laughs> and where has this bigger idea come from? I mean, we've seen uh, land ranges, you know, up in the north of Kenya or on the grasslands in the savannas. Um, we've never really seen reef ranges. So is this idea, has it been taken from an existing uh, idea? Yeah, very much so. So what we set up about 10 years ago was a system called the Wildlife Conservation and Management Monitoring System. And that was essentially a ranger-based monitoring tool that the Conservancy Rangers started doing. So they were recording information on uh, elephant carcasses, on sightings of wildlife, on human-wildlife conflict. Um, and they've now been systematically doing that for about 10 years. Um, they have a system that is paper-based. We've kept it very simple. Um, purely for the reason that it's expensive if we go into gadgets and a lot of technology and again this is a system we want conservancies to do on their own. So we've brought that idea of a simple paper-based sort of ranger-based system and now trying to apply it into the marine environment. So this is a bit of a first. Um, it's, it's, I don't think there are many places where communities themselves are doing this kind of monitoring for themselves. So, so this is really something we're trying now. What sort of impact is this work having on the lives of the people? 
You know, that's a big thing is that these conservancies have to have to have a dual purpose. So they're, they're about protecting the environment and conserving the environment, but they're very much about improving the livelihoods of people, of the people who, um, who are members of those conservancies. Um, so they, um, what, what we're seeing, and, and it takes, it's a slow progress. I think we, we, sometimes there are unrealistic expectations that things are going to change quickly. But um, you're seeing one of the biggest impacts, particularly in northern Kenya, is security, about improved security and creating this foundation, of a stable foundation upon which now um, sort of economic development can, can come in. So whether that's tourism, whether it's marketing of livestock, um, beadwork for women and providing a market for women. So definitely there's an impact on livelihoods. It's not always a direct financial impact, but it's these, these other indirect impacts that are very significant. And then what about the impact on the environment? Because it's Essentially, that is what you are trying to protect and conserve through these projects. Um, how, how we do know that it's not going to be overnight that you're going to see change, but what impact do you hope to see? Well, I think already we're seeing an improvement, or at least a stabilization, particularly for wildlife. And this is talking about these conservancies that have been in operation for. Uh, some of them 20 years um, or you know the majority for at least 10 years up in sort of the northern North, North Kenya landscape and there we're seeing a stabilization of wildlife numbers a big uh, impact which is probably the most significant one in the last few years is that they've really reduced the elephant poaching we had a crisis in, in as you're aware in uh, around 2012 and that's brought down it's dropped by 80% to what it was um, a few years ago so that's one of the major impacts and that's a very significant thing that these rangers are doing and what are your hopes going forward because we saw those reef rangers for example out in the water uh, in a year t in a year's time what do you hope for you know, for me, in terms of from the monitoring side, I can see that the, they are really, um, they're understanding what they're monitoring. They're, and they've got the process um, down and, and, you know, they're doing some great, some great work. I was really nice to see how confident they are with it now. So, so this will be something that, um, that they'll be picking up and they'll do routinely on their own as part of their, their monitoring system for their own conservancy. So, you know, hopefully this is an activity, the, the coral reef monitoring is only going to be done twice a year because of the tie, the, the seasons, it's, it's not possible to do it at certain times. Right. Of year. All right, Juliet, thank you so much uh, for all the work you're doing. Um, you know, advising these uh, rangers here and essentially transforming the community and the environment. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, with me, Juliet King. She is the technical advisor for the Northern Rangelands Trust. From that, we shift our focus now on NTV Wild Talk. Here is your chance to win an awesome prize. It's time for our wild guest question. List four responsibilities undertaken by the reef rangers. List four responsibilities undertaken by the reef rangers. To participate, just like the NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline post that's associated with this question. The first person to answer correctly wins lunch or dinner worth 5,000 shillings at the incredible Zen Garden located in Nairobi. The winner will have the option of having a delicious meal at the Bamboo Oriental Restaurant or the Jade Coffee and Tea House at Zen Garden. The winner also gets free entry for four people and a vehicle to any national park of their choice, courtesy of the Kenya Wildlife Service. One bottle of wine, courtesy of Wines of the World, and a gift hamper, courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply. Last week's lucky winner was Naliaka Lukorito. And now, here is our Wild Pick segment.
Conservation and communities go hand in hand. If communities don't understand the environment that surrounds them, they won't understand the importance of protecting it and the benefits that they'll get from safeguarding it. But what's even better is when communities are involved in the conservation process, just like what's happening here on some of the islands in Lamu, thanks to the Nature Conservancy and the Northern Rangelands Trust. Well, that's it on NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again next Tuesday at 10 p.m. You're not even recording. The red light's not on. <laughs> Yeah, see what you can do. I'll keep a hold of it. Sasa, he. Are we okay? But, I guess. Yeah. get in, Smith. NTV Wild Talk, in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.